Hi, everyone. I'm Stephen Van Tassel, Wildlife Control Consultant, bringing you another episode of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. So I'm really glad to have you with me. Don't take, don't forget to take a few moments, subscribe to our channel, and make sure you uh, contact me if you have questions, concerns, issues you'd like to see covered in our Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife. You can reach me at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. That's wildlife control consultant at gmail.com. Well, today we have a very interesting guest, Bill Anderson. He is the general manager of the Rascal Eradicator. And you may be saying, what in the world is Rascal Eradicator? Well, it's a new product that uses carbon monoxide to kill vertebrate pests that are burrowing animals. And so you may have heard some other products that are out there in the market now because it's carbon monoxide becoming the new thing in vertebrate pest control and the technology is beginning to advance. So I saw his device and I thought, wow, that's really cute. Uh, I think that it had some flexibility. So I said, we got to get him on the show. And he was kind enough to be with us. Bill, welcome to the Living the Wildlife podcast. Thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, glad to be here and talk about the Rascal Eradicator and help your people understand what it can do for you. All right. Well, we're really glad to have you on the show. So take a few moments. Tell us about the Rascal Eradicator. Like, how did it, Where did the idea come from? Describe the product <clears throat> for our audience. Well, our, uh, our founder is, is Willie the Burrow. Willie was a 35-year-old burrow that is, uh, was Doc, who's one of the owners, Burrow. And uh, Willie was in love with the potbelly pig next door. And would run out of his bur run out of his uh, um, stable every day in the morning, running past the prairie dog holes over to the fence to see if his friend was there. And so Doc realized that a 35 year old burrow really doesn't need to have run an obstacle course. So he asked Billy Martin if Billy could do something about that. Now Billy's the kind of guy that um, he had he had his own oil field business at 17. He had five drilling rigs. Oh my goodness! At 21, oh. and so he's the kind of guy that like looks at something and then says, "I can do that." Wow. So five wow. years later, and 200 hours of field work in several designs, and a patent and an EPA registration, it was on the market. That's amazing. amazing. So uh, getting a little bit of feedback here. I'm not sure if that's me or you. So I'm just going to make a, try to make a quick check here. Okay. Uh, so I'm, yeah, no, it should be looking fine. I don't know where that's coming from. Well, so, sorry, everyone. Sorry for my interruption. So, uh, so he's one of those handy men who just had skills with his hands and decided to develop this product. So what struck me about it was it looked like it was it had high mobility. Some of the other products on the market seem to be, uh, I know one of them's fairly heavy, uh, but there seem to be you know mobility out in the landscape. In Mon I'm from Montana, and if you're in a more urbanized area, you know weight isn't as big of a deal because you know you're right there in the truck, and you probably get the truck close to the location if you have to move it very far. But out here in Montana. Mobility can be a little bit of a of a challenge, especially when you can't drive the truck everywhere. So, uh, talk talk about that a little bit more. How does a where does the engine fit on that thing? Well, it's it's specially designed to um, just be in the middle, and it's it's designed so it doesn't roll over or tip over. Okay. And mm -hmm. as far as mobility goes, that's a good point because realistically, if you notice how big the casters are, we're kind of lazy people. We don't like to work more than we have to. <laughs> So it's really designed, we tell people it's designed for one-handed one movement. You can literally move it with one hand in the field. And wow. it's easy It's easy to move around. And people in the urban uh, rural interface areas like it too for that because it's real easy to, um, to move around. Some people do put it in the back of their ATV mm -hmm. or do put it in the back of their pickup truck. And so for those people, if you're doing that, we recommend the optional 50 foot hoses because it gives you a little bit more room to do your parameter um, without having to move it. Right. But right. It, it is easy to move. And that's one of okay. the things that people like about it. Yeah, because it has four tires, so it looked look to me like a little wagon, and so that's what's yeah. mysterious. Because normally, when I think of a of a gas of a of a lawn mowing mower, it's like a Briggs and Stratton type thing, you know. It it's is four cycles, but it, yours looked like it was 
very narrow. And I, I just was like, where's the motor? Where's the motor? I'm well, that's kind of an interesting question because our patent is what we call the resonator. Okay. So the carbon monoxide gas comes out of the motor, goes into a stainless steel tube. And we'll talk about how why we have stainless steel later. Okay. Then it goes into the resonator, which is built inside the frame. And the carbon monoxide actually hits itself and it cools it and it makes it quiet. So if you sit there, I don't know why you'd want to do it, but if you sit there and listen to the end of the hose, you can barely hear it. Nice. And it comes out pretty cool. And we think that that helps to help the process along because it doesn't alarm the rodents and they just uh, get the carbon monoxide pump down there and uh, they attaches to the hemoglobin like it always does and right. they just go to sleep and become part of the fertilizer okay so right. let's talk about the kind of pressure you have coming out of it so uh how what kind of force is coming out of the other end i mean do you have you measured any of that in terms oh, of how you know, much it's gas not a, it's out? not it's not a pressurized unit okay so um there are mar- ones on the market that do pressurized tanks yeah and they're they're a lot more complex a lot more expensive and there's a lot more things that are inherent in using them this comes out and um it just comes out as a flow and it goes into we have two hoses and we like to build things so that they're tough because we know how people use them in the field because they use them like we use them so it goes it goes into either a a airplane grade aluminum nozzle or if you're using the gopher crucifiers, what I call them, okay. um, they uh, goes into a stainless steel nozzle with a handle on it that you can use as a probe if you're looking for your gophers too. So you so, can use so you, that's for your pocket gophers. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. correct. All right, and um, that's how that's how it gets in there, and we put put them in, and then you cover them with dirt, and we like to tell people to kind of tamp it down so you get a nice seal. Mm-hmm. And um, then seven to 12 minutes later, it's done. You can move things around while you're doing it. Most people set one up and then they go to the next hose and then they do, you do a, you do a perimeter. Sure. You know, usually, usually either about a 50 foot perimeter or about a 96 to 98 foot perimeter. So you, the, so the animals you use it for are pocket gophers. I'm assuming ground squirrels, pocket prairie, gophers, ground prairie squirrels, dogs, prairie, prairie dogs. dogs. And moles. And moles. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, do you ha- have any data? So seven to 12 minutes per, per hose. So you have two hoses, so you can do two different burrows at the same time. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And do you have, uh, and how much carbon monoxide is coming out? Have you had that measured? What your uh, parts per million is? Well, you know, we use the data, the data that's, we use the data that's provided by the manufacturer for okay. that engine. Um, we have not done research on it ourselves. All right. Uh, it actually works out to 3,702 grams per hour. And okay. that's based off of um, information from the California Environmental Agency Air Resources Board research. Gotcha. Okay. So we use the manufacturer's information. Okay. And, and um, it's, 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 it's toxic. sufficient yeah. to take care of the job. Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. how do you, it's so, and, so um, what do you have in terms of what's it cost? The the unit itself is twenty five hundred dollars. Okay, and uh, that you know some people kind of go, oh, but yeah. that, when you look at the other carbon monoxide dispensers, we're, we're yeah. in this kind of same range, yeah. and we have two hoses instead of one, and right. it's really easy to to pull around. And when when you sit there and look at the operating cost. If you're operating efficiently and um, you're able to keep up a good pace, it literally works out with the fuel to about a dime a barrel. Wow. So, okay. um, you know, that's something that our PCOs like because it's low cost in, in operation and it's low maintenance. You just basically for the uh, engine. And the only thing we tell you is that in the, in the wintertime, when you're not using it, take the hoses off it and don't put the hoses really tight and uh, just store it inside. We don't like to see them. We got a guy that just leaves it out in the field. Oh, no. no, 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 no I told him, hey, put it, put it in your shed, man. Oh, it's okay out there. It's fine. 
Yeah, no, you don't want um, to do you don't want to do that. No. So there's uh, so twenty five hundred. So you're a mid range because I've seen them go. I've seen them go as low as about twelve twelve hundred up to sixteen thousand, depending yeah. on how, all the bells and whistles you get for yeah. what I call the Cadillac the Cadillac version. The so large have, version. Yeah. So you have two vert. You have two hoses. And you're using just regular gasoline. Do you have any smoke yep. oil or anything like that with your No, pump? that's that's um, the the smoke dispensers are a patented feature of of, a, of one of our competitors. I gotcha. Okay. So, so are we, you able? Are you able to see at the? Because one of the challenges is the whether whether holes are connected or not. That's true. So are you able to? Uh, are you able to see whether there's any gas coming out of another hole? Um, you, you you might be able to. Generally, we find with prairie dogs that they're connected a lot less than people think they are. Mm -hmm. And you can, you, I know you're an expert. What do you feel like that? Do you feel well, like I, I wish I wanted to do some research on that because I wanted to have some sort of a smoke generator, not toxic, just to just to see if burrows were connected or not. And uh, because I think there's some. Uh, I think there's some truth to that. There's a lot more single hole burrows or just two holes where there's just an entrance and exit. Well, depending yeah. which way the bird, the animal's moving in there, but the idea of moving beyond to three to four, those are a little bit rarer. Uh, maybe if the colony wasn't disturbed, but very few colonies are undisturbed nowadays. I mean, there's, yeah. there's like, I don't know how the prairie dogs are able to stand the pressure against them if it wasn't for their reproductive rate, because it's like a war on them all the time. But uh, so I, I think there's a lot less. It's just that in terms of time, it's just you like, you're always looking for a way to save that, that time oh. from treating another burrow <laughs> if you knew they were connected. Yeah. Um, what we always tell people is treat the active ones. So yeah. if you're out in the field there and you, you know the signs of the activity, you know, the droppings, the diggings, the disturbance of the, of the land around it. So we tell people to treat the active ones. And then the ones that are in, un, inactive, we usually suggest while you're out there, if there's an inactive hole over there, just go ahead and fill it in, you know, and so that so that, you know, when you go back to check your check your efficiency rating that that was a filled hole and there wasn't anything in it. So that's kind of what we have people do. Yeah. And I like to, I'm not a flag person. I, I use um, water-based marking paint okay. and I just, I just X them out. And then that also tells me if there was a dig out or a dig in. Um, I, I, you know, I, I'm not going to tell you the efficiency rates, but I'll, I'll tell you what our customers tell us. Sure, and absolutely. Customers tell us that the prairie dogs, the prairie dog rates are in the high nineties, okay. and the gopher rates are in the mid nineties. So okay. that's what our customers are telling us. Now, when you say gopher, and, uh, do you mean pocket gopher? Yeah. Okay. Because I, cause the reason I have to ask, because here in Montana, gopher is kind of this really squishy word. It's kind of, it's a, you know, it's <laughs> it sort of like the Caddyshack the thing. Is, is it a ground squirrel? Yeah. Is it a pocket gopher? What are you referring to? So I'm, I'm yeah. trying very hard to get yeah. our citizens to stop using the word gopher because I don't, I don't know what a gopher is. Good luck. Uh, well, I'm, I've <laughs> actually had some success with the extension educators. I'm getting them yeah. to stop using the word gopher, at least to me. That's so, good people um, to start with. Yeah. So, you, so that's pocket gophers. You said about uh, uh -huh. eight, above 80% in yeah. ground squirrels. Um. Any data I don't on that? remember any, any talking to anybody about the ground squirrels recently. Okay, but we've never had anybody complain about them. You okay. know. Now I've heard some wildlife control operators using these devices on voles, which is totally blowing me away because well, I'm like, uh, they're so porous. But guys are telling me that they have success, which totally blew my mind. Have you had any people using your product? Oh, you're still new, so I'm putting you on the spot here. Like you haven't had um, your distribution out there for a while. I would, I would, I would love to say that both bowl tests we did were successful, but okay. I'm not going to say that. Yeah. So do, it, do you think it, that uh, it was we, porous? The soil was too porous in your situation because uh, maybe a more clayey soil would be a little bit more effective. Well, the um, bowl areas that we did were both um, high-end uh, golf courses in okay. northwest Colorado. All right. 
And um, the voles were almost on the surface. I mean, the, the uh, okay. tunnels were like partially up above the surface. Yeah. And it was very sandy and very loose. So yeah. it was it was not successful. Type the thing. Well, I would uh yeah, appreciate your frankness there. And I would it's I'd like, love to talk to those people. Uh yeah, I think that there's been, of course, you know, our soil here in Montana, we know we have some sandy soils too, but I I've I've talked to some guys and beyond Montana, I think you know, you get on some of the Facebook pages because I would encourage you to do that. Some of these guys are experimenting, yeah. they're having success which is kind of blowing my mind a little bit oh wow um so you know they're using some of the other other devices because yours is relatively new Mm -hmm. when did you when did you come to market well we've been in business for 10 years and um basically about the last three years we've been been in higher production than they were before okay so uh we we've basically been uh we have them in 28 different states now and um, so we, we have pretty good distribution of them. Okay. And we have them in everything from uh, sand, sandy soil in Indiana to um, rocky desert soil in Tucson um, to high plains uh, grazing soil in up by Pawnee Buttes and over by Sterling. Okay. Uh, you know, so we have them in a, in a lot of different things. Um, the only place that we had problems with was a gentleman in Oregon. Uh, you know, we, we fought, we follow up on our, on our sales. So we, okay. I call somebody in two days and I call them in, in two months. I just want to make sure that they're doing well. And after two months, he said it wasn't working. And I'm like, what? And so what we figured out was that the ground that he was in, there was so many cracks. He's actually sent it to me. It was actually looked like, um it was like uh just totally totally cracked and um the gas was leaking up. not yeah. being able to be efficient in there wow so he's, he went he he's went in the back west, the western end of those states he's, he's, no he, he's in the far east or of oregon he, excuse me eastern end right that's more yeah. desert area okay yeah, yeah but the, saw um the uh snake river valley okay. so he went back in, in in the spring and just kicked it Okay. So yeah. he he was pretty happy with it. A little more moisture, yeah. And, yeah, the, yeah, moisture yeah. in the soil moisture. was a little bit better. So wow. But um, that's really the only person that that I was just shocked. And um, you know, we tell people, you know, we answer our phone twenty four seven, and uh, <laughs> if they have problems, we're there. We get calls from the Gopher people yeah. in uh, Tucson in the middle of the night. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's working really good, man. We're doing good. Okay, thanks. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering how much longer that 24 hour response time I, is going to work. I, I yeah. do it. I do it. You know, so they're they're, they're good guys. So they well, have, they have a lot of success doing. Um, like they do a lot of common areas for homeowners associations. Yeah. And a lot of golf courses down there, and they they've really enjoyed it. Are you aware of any states that regulate the product uh, in the sense that requiring a license? Well, there there are some states like Colorado and Montana that you do not need a PCO license. You don't need a license. For it. That's correct. However, you do have to abide by the regulations that that are in effect. So, right. yeah, um, we have no, we have none in our state. And I understand in Colorado there are some guidelines for how close you can get to a structure. That's yeah. the only regulation that I saw with the devices. And I yeah. tried to get those regulations here because I think they're reasonable for safety purposes. They are. But the regulations in um, the, um, this is regulations right here. Okay. And those regulations pretty much establish that there are certain distances that you need to be away, away from an occupied building. Yeah. There are special ways that a PCO can go closer and that involves monitoring inside inside the buildings and of course they're not occupied right right Um, right. so there are special regulations that enable pcos to go closer oh okay all right so it's it's kind of murky you know and we just tell people you know you have to check your local regulations yeah and um 
the EPA, you know, ours is registered as the EPA as a pest control device because we voluntarily did that. Sure. And it's also patented. Okay. And um, so. my point is, is no, there, you're not aware of any state that requires a PCO license to use it. You know, I don't know. Yeah. You have to check with your local people. Yeah, I'm not, I I, people. I'm not aware of any. Of I'm, any, I'm any not either. States. Utah, Utah is the same way. It's not. Yeah. So it's, uh, but absolutely you want to check, but I do think now, do you have guidelines in your, uh, brochure and your manual for how close a person should get to a structure? No, we don't. We just okay. basically refer to people that, um, you need to check your local regulations. Gotcha. Um, okay. we, 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 uh, uh, say that a lot because, you know, you want to make sure that you're doing the correct thing. You know, right. you don't want to run it incorrectly. Um, and it, since it does produce carbon monoxide, you have to be careful because it is a, a gas that has a very detrimental effect on human beings. Oh, absolutely. And the, people, the people that called me and said that it doesn't work on in-laws, I was like, well, if your in-law <laughs> has fur and big teeth and lives in a burrow, yes. Otherwise, no. Yeah, Please, I have no. To, that, that's correct. That's a different department, as I as yeah. I tell people, right? So the if so, do you have so I you don't have any recommendations for people that have no local law, local no local rules? Like in Montana, we have no guidelines for how close you can get to a structure. Do you have? There's nothing in your in your. Well, manual. I would say, I would say per, personally, I think these are pretty good guidelines. Okay, so you can follow Colorado. Colorado. If, you don't, if you don't have guidelines, follow Colorado. <laughs> yeah, I thought they were reasonable. I think it was like a hundred feet for pocket gophers and twenty-five gophers. or thirty feet for ground squirrels, and I think fifty feet for prairie 150 dogs. For prairie dogs, one hundred and fifty yeah. for prairie dogs. Okay, yeah. So that's that's a yeah. pretty that's very reasonable, and you can usually treat with other things closer if you have to, or yeah. you can trap. That would be very reasonable. We get, we get we have a lot of people now that um, are a lot of pest control companies and a lot of wildlife control companies that are using them in areas that um, it's much easier acceptance of carbon monoxide mm -hmm. and it's easier to do. And um, our, our units are very discreet yeah. and so that they attract very little attention. Like if you were in a field that was being treated next to a King Supers and a, an apartment development. Um, you know, it's not, doesn't attract a lot of attention and it's really e efficient and you don't run into secondary bait problems. That's right. And one of the things that we like to, right. to have people remember is that this is pretty much a one and done. And people might say, well, baiting takes a little bit less. You know, you still spend probably two to four minutes a hole on bait, right? Yeah. Well, it would, it would depend so, on how you're baiting. Yeah, it would depend on how you're on how you're baiting because you with zinc phosphide you have to visit at least twice, so you have to have a pre bait twice, and yeah. you have to go back with the zinc, and then it may be three times because some of the labels are now requiring yeah. a pre test, but that you don't have to go to every hole for a pre test, so you still it's you have yeah. to make a few visits, and then follow up afterwards. You know, uh, with, well, with yeah, to see if, uh, yeah. see if it worked for you. Sure. But there's yeah. no, uh, but you don't have to do any field work like with Rosal where you have yeah. to you know, do a grid search on the field for prairie that when you're using it on prairie dogs. Yeah. Yeah. So there's definitely some huge advantages. The fact you don't have, if someone's dog's dead five days later, well, you know, it wasn't you, it was something else. Right. So, uh, there is definitely some advantages there in, you don't have to worry about something being left behind where you would we, be oxygen. We have um, a customer that uses them at a, a summer camp nice. and um, he was using bait for the moles, the, um, the, you know, the little worms, the little worms. Yeah. And um, local um, dogs found them. Really? Yeah. Oh my goodness. And then, the, then the state came in and said, you're not, going to do this this is a summer camp you're not going to use bait it's no kidding wow. and so he's real happy with it now okay he's, he's doing fine no kidding so, all right what did the dogs uh, be after yeah they free dug, they, dogs is a real problem they dug they dug it up they dug and, it up yeah yep, yep. um one of the other things that that i really like you were talking 
talking about how mobile it is. We have customers that use them where um, larger units or um, there's like terrain problems. Yeah. You know, and one of the other things that we just put on, we like we like safety, you know, and like I said, we don't like to do too much work. So <laughs> we put um, lift handles on the front and back. Yeah. So it's really easy to get them in your pickup truck or your ATV. And uh, we didn't increase the price because that's a safety issue. Okay. How much does it weigh? Um, with the uh, 25 foot hoses, it weighs in at 112. Okay. With the um, uh, 50 foot hoses, it weighs in at 132. Okay. That's so, right. and, and your, your analogy about the size of a, um, of a of a kid's wagon is pretty true. Yeah, I would just what I was seeing. If I only saw photos of it, there were no there was no scale in it other than I think a person was in the photo. And like, yeah, wow, that just looks. It kind of looked cute, you know. And just in terms of that low profile, because the tires are what six inch tires, twelve inch the tires. T- the tires tires are ten inch. Ten inch twire, ten inch so, tires. So you know you can get yeah. over stuff with it because you have a higher you know higher diameter. Just that you know you have to think about this stuff when you're out in the you know because Montana is different than you know, but Massachusetts and other places, I'm I'm used to being from Massachusetts. So, you know, when when you're out here, you got, well, you've got to get over stuff. So, um, you know, the ground isn't always perfectly level the way you would like it to be perhaps. So you got to get over things and that, that matters because it's all about the convenience because time because pest control. The one thing they don't have is the ability to multiply themselves. So they have to make their time as efficient as possible, right? It's not like factory work where you can, you know, have a machine cranking out more, more widgets. It just doesn't work that way. So uh, where do people purchase your product? Our product is, Found at our website, which okay. is Rascal yeah. Hold Eradicated. that picture right up for people because right people get a picture of it. Yeah, and even the you even the base. In my face, huh? Well, no, no. Okay. And that's so we got that. <laughs> okay, but then lift it up so they can see the device, though, in case oh. they may not have seen it before. Uh, yeah, that's that's kind of it's not a good picture, but it's not. Um, but it at least gives them a feel for yeah. what it's like, and that's like. So yeah, here's your cool. handle yep. over here, and here's your hose oh. rack, and yep. um, it's as simple as it looks, and um, it has we we use the. Briggs and Stratton Easy Pull Engine. Okay. So if if it takes two pulls to pull it, it's a bad day. Bad day. Um, okay. The other thing, the other thing is kind of good about it is that unlike some carbon monoxide dispensing units, you can use it in any temperature you want. You can go if it's. I tell people as long as you can stand being in the field, you can use it. Right. Okay. So there's no no temperature requirements as far as it's too hot or it's too cold. Four cycle or two cycle. It's a um, uh, two cycle. Two cycle. So even with the oil that you have to put in with the gasoline, you're still not oh, no, seeing excuse me, four cycle. Four cycle. So you. St- oh, okay. Yeah. Any thought of moving to a two cycle? No. No. Um, okay. This this we we purposely picked this engine because it produces carbon monoxide like we need. Okay. And it's a very um, easy engine to start, and it's a very durable engine, and like. Let's say um, you have as a as a PCO, you have a six month warranty on everything except for the hoses. Okay. And um, you know we honor our warranty. If there's a question, yeah, you got to call us. All right. And um, so we find we find that like let's say that in the future, which we haven't had to replace any engines yet, and some of these machines literally run eight, ten, twelve hours a day. Yeah. People are, are running them that much. So we haven't had to replace any engines yet, but the engine is basically, it's it's a stock engine that you basically can buy from Briggs and Strat or us, yep. and you basically unbolt it, bolt it back in, attach the hose, and you go. Yeah, it's that it's that easy. You know, yeah. we we went we made it so that. We know how people are going to use it in the field, yeah. and um, we want to yeah. make sure that that it lasts them. It has a lot of the fixtures are stainless steel or brass, which you don't see in a lot of places. Right. And we right. use we use a special um, hot water, high density hoses that um, are very very durable, and it's a uh, black powder coated, so it looks kind of cool. I think. Okay. And are they how flexible are they? They're they're pretty they're pretty flexible. Um, they do kink, so we don't tell people don't get kinky with them. Right. Okay. Um, so. <laughs> okay. That's clever. 
That's clever. Most people, like most people, when they put them in the field, they honestly um, leave them leave them out behind them. Like, let's say you're going to to a, a a new spot, they just leave them behind them and just haul the whole thing right along, and then get they use the hoses to establish where the perimeter is. Right. And say, okay, that was the last one I did. Now I'm in this area. Right. Okay. It works, it works out pretty so good. So they move the they leave they drop the hose and then they move the device to see yeah. how far it goes and then they use then they start moving toward the device and then yeah. they probably go beyond it and then leapfrog. Is that the idea? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. And I, I was gonna mention mention too that um, you know, we do have several operators that operate more than one in the field. Okay. And I, I don't want to make more work for somebody's employees, sure. but you can you can you can easily do two units. One person can take care of two units and still have time left over to play on their phone. So oh, yeah. Uh, well, that, yeah. With a seven to ten, seven. What do you say? Seven to twelve minute injection time. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Because then you can really be just having one going, and you're moving another, and then yeah. so you're have keep an occupied that way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, so it it cut it cuts down on operators' costs that way, and when you consider the price of them, you know, it makes it comparable. Um, for ease of use and the size of it to, to maybe use that as an alternative to a larger unit. Sure. Absolutely. And we all, and we also have people that are running the larger units out there and using our machines to go around the perimeters or go in places that are, are, you know, are difficult. They don't gotcha. want to um, end up uh, bogged down or tipped over. Yeah, so more of like a little tactical unit to be able to hit we those. We've had all kinds of people. Yeah. Awesome. yeah. So you said you were oh. at stainless steel. Yeah. yeah. Why did you have yeah, this? We have all kinds called of stainless steel. Talk well, the stainless those. steel, we have the stainless steel hose that the, the we have the stainless steel hose that comes off the engine and it goes into the resonator. And we use stainless steel there because you know there's a heat problem and corrosion problem and we we want our people to be able to use this thing year after year after year, and okay. um, they do. They do. And how long can someone use the engine before they need to change the oil and perform regular maintenance? Um, you have to you have to follow the uh, instructions in your book. Okay. Uh, we give you two manuals. We give you our manual, and we give you the Briggs and Stratton manual. So gotcha. we ask people to do it um, using the uh, manufacturers. Uh, suggested so because it's a standard engine any any type of lawn lawn repair comp lawn mower yeah. repair company you can bring it then say hey change the oil and they're not going to be like we don't know what this is they're yeah. going to go straight away to it okay. yeah yeah, yeah so uh, um you, you can bring it to your local briggs and stratton people yeah and nice. um we cover it you know we do pretty well on warranties we don't cover people dropping them off for the back of trucks at 20 miles an hour <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Sure. Well, that, that's an important, that's an important distinction. So let's talk a little about what, what is the, what is the thing that a customer uh, doesn't know that should know before they purchase the product? And then what is the one thing you find that a lot of times they're surprised by with the product? Well, I think a lot of them are surprised by how easy it is to use because I, I do demos for people sometime and I take it out there and put the hoses on it, it's ready to go. If we're shipping it to you, that's the only thing you have to do is put the hoses on it, fill it full of oil, fill it full of gas, give it a tug, and you're ready to go. Right. So there, so I, I you know, like I take it out and I put it in the holes and stamp the holes, start it up, and I'm like, okay. And they're like, that's it. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. It, that's the way it'll work, you know. And um, most people want it, want to know, like, why they should use carbon monoxide, and th there's there's good reasons for it, you know. And um, our units, I, I wouldn't go if I had a ten thousand acre project, I probably wouldn't use our units. Right. But we do have several people that use them right. on their on their property for four hundred or six hundred acres. Yeah. And um, usually what they do is go yeah. through and do the control and then they use they just leave it in the back of their ATV or something. And then 
every month or two they go out they go out and uh, just keep keep the perimeter safe and yeah. make sure yeah. that everything is you know they don't get reinvaded because you know it's reinvasion is kind of the way it goes. Yeah, I, as I tell people, uh, all problems come from your neighbors. So it's it's never your problem. It's, they're never your ground squirrels. They're never your prairie dogs. They're always the neighbors, and so it's just the way it is. So, and yeah, a good laugh that's true. That. And so, they don't want to do anything about it. That's right. And so it's always yeah, your neighbor's true. problem. It's never yours. It's always your neighbors. So, how about so? Yeah, I think that the there's a lot of advantages in terms as people are growing concern about, you know, the secondary effects of anticoagulants and some of the toxic yeah. effects of, of toxicants. And plus people have a, a, a comfortableness, do you think, with carbon monoxide because it comes out of our automobile, uh, you know, unless you have a battery, unless you have a battery machine and that's pretty rare, but I mean, it's, you're already dealing, you're around carbon monoxide all the time. You know, and so it's, yeah. it's, I guess there's that, you don't have that same fear factor that people can often have and, at, at aggressively. So in some cases with toxicants, right. Do you think that's part of the reason why there's a greater comfort level with clients with carbon monoxide? I, I think so. And even um, the American uh, Humane Society called it the least unobjectable method for euthanasia. Wow. So that is, um, that, that's quite a that's quite a compliment because I'm sure that was painful for them. It was, and, and, uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, and, and it's really true because they just basically just go to sleep and they become fertilizer. Yeah. You yeah. know? And um, so that, that's, that's kind of one of the things. And uh, we find that in like a lot of people that we have them are using them in like the urban rural interface areas yeah. and they don't get much, attention and when people are, are explaining to them you know what they're doing most people are like oh that's a good way to do it yeah i think plus they know there's nothing there's no residual so i think that really yeah. means a lot because i've been hearing reports from people they're like they want to kill something but they're very nervous about the secondary poisoning and the residuals because again yeah. you know it's people aren't leashing their dogs they're leaving. And then some people have concern about raptors and this sort of thing. And mm -hmm. like, well, this is, this is one of the challenges with toxicants. And so uh, you have to, you know, there's al always pros and cons for everything. And so sure. I think this is that niche product. I think you're right. You know, 10,000 acres would be a lot of time at, you know, seven to 10 minutes of burrow. That's a lot. Yeah. So, but for, for those smaller acreages, if people want to put the time in and it's all mm -hmm. about what the client wants and be able to meet that need need for them. Yeah. So you have uh, people can purchase it directly from you. What's the shipping cost on that? Is there a shipping? Well, generally, included? generally, we generally most places in the U S are under $170. Okay. We ship for the uh, ground and generally it'll get to you in three days. That's not bad. That's not a bad price for given yeah. that it weighs a hundred. Yeah. And so is it created? Is it some sort of wooden box or is it it's, a, it, co it comes in a cardboard box and it, the wheels are on it and um, it takes you about three and a half minutes to assemble it. Nice. And uh, nice. then you need to put about 18 to 22 ounces of oil in it, mm -hmm. fill up the gas, prime it three times and away you go. Wow. That's incredible. Read the manual too. I'm wondering if you read Well, the yeah, manual. read the manual, everybody. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, don't um, yeah. read the manual first. Make sure you, everything's good. And do teach your people yeah. about carbon monoxide that if you start getting a headache yeah. in the field, something's wrong. Maybe there's a leak somewhere yeah. that you're not aware of. That's one of the first signs of carbon monoxide poisoning is getting a headache. So it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a powerful powerful material you know it really is yeah and i think that people are, are coming around to it because um like you said there's no residual yep. and uh we have customers that use it in uh areas that they're doing transition from uh standard crops to organic crops mm -hmm. now no carbon monoxide device can be used for organic um, materials because strictly because of the way that it's created, um, mm -hmm. because it's created in an internal combustion engine. Right. So, right. um, you know, I'm sure if you wanted to like make a fire and blow <laughs> and blow it in there, that would be okay. <laughs> There's people up there. So, yeah. so there is a market for somebody, you know, yeah, that would be, uh, uh, like, like uh, yeah. 
I, I think that the, know, uh, the organic people, it's unfortunate that the carbon monoxide had, didn't, uh, I think it would be didn't make it. It didn't make it. I think the same thing with the rodentinator. I think that came really close to making it, but it was off by a vote or two. I think, from what I understand, it's. I think the, I think the organic people are going to have to kind of make some. They make they make uh, concessions in some areas. They're going to sure. need. They're going to need to think about the vertebrate side of things more especially if we're going to larger acreages it's very mm-hmm. difficult for producers to put a fence up uh, when you think of the cost of putting a fence up and the environmental impact of a fence a lot of people think sure. that you know fences are non-lethal well uh, not quite they're they're quite disruptive to the environment in many ways yeah. so i i would hope that they would explore that maybe somebody can come up with a a, a, a valid way for the present rules of organic farming to create carbon monoxide. And yeah, I mean, making a wood fire, it seems pretty inefficient, not to mention the carbon that would be out there, but <laughs> I, I don't know. I just, but I, also the fire hazard, we, we're a fire hazard yeah. state here in Montana. So oh, yeah. you know, just works. to let everybody know that when you use the ignitable gas cartridges, the main, the, the main active ingredients, carbon monoxide folks. Yeah. And so basically this removes the fire element because it's contained sure combustion engine whereas i tell people when they're using the ignitable gas cartridges make sure you're not setting the prairie on fire i mean that's yeah. like bad we don't want that so uh it's- we, actually, we actually have um underneath the engine there's actually a um a guard underneath the engine. heat guard heat shield yeah. yeah that's important because out here in the west it doesn't mean you hear producers starting fires all the time from their tractors sure. and there's a spark created because they're dragging something. And, uh, it's kind of weird to me because I'm still getting used to it being in the East, you know, fire forest fires. is like, what, what are you talking about? Why just, why are you having all these fires come out here? Yeah. I'm like, okay, I get it now. It's dangerous. It gets really, really dry. Well, what's the last, uh, any final words that you want to leave for our people? I would love you to hold that card up one more time okay. so I can read off the, or you actually let you do it. Give them a phone number that they can use and sure. go ahead. Phone number is 303-910-9106. And yes, I do answer at any time. That's that's amazing. All right. And our website is www.rascaleradicator.com. We got lots of uh, interesting things in there and you got a little video so you can see how we're doing it. And um, I just want to remind people that for the PCOs, it costs you about a dime a burrow to take care of this. That's uh, that's truly amazing. Well, everyone, well, any any final words you want to leave for our audience before we before we close it out tonight? Just thank you very much for having me on, and and uh, check out our website. Give us a call. Absolutely. Well, thank you. And then, and as this is Bill Anderson, everyone, he's the general manager of Rascal Eradicator, and that's rascaleradicator.com. and you can. Visit them. Let them know that you heard us from the Pest Geek Podcast, Living the please, Wildlife. Please. We are very glad to have you on board here. And definitely stay in touch. If you come up with some new materials, definitely reach out to us again. Maybe we'll do have to do another show. And sure. if you do any additional research on your project, definitely sure. would love to hear that. We love getting geeky here on the Pest Geek Podcast. Well, that's going to be it. We're going to wrap right. it up I'd here. Like, I'd like uh, to ask one question, too. Sure. If you got if somebody's out there with a carbon monoxide unit and they're having success with voles, give me a call because I'd like to hear about it. Well, you heard that everyone. So I, yeah. I've heard the, it anecdotally, and I think that um, I think if you joined us on on the on Facebook, some of our okay. groups, I think you know the National Wildlife Control Operators Group would be one. We're, we're in the we're in the society in that one, and you also can go to the Pest Geek Podcast and join our group. And there's also not there's also some others out there we can certainly okay. chat about. But there are uh, there are people who are claiming success, which like I said, totally. Blows I'm interested. Mind. Totally blows my mind. Well, this is your opportunity, people, to help to help out to uh, yeah. help help everyone work together because we are in this together. We're a very small community. When you think about other industries, there's not a lot of pest controllers out there. Even though it may feel that way, they're not. They're really not. So we're, we've got to help each other. Thank you very much for being on the right, show again, everyone. I'm Stephen Van Tassel. Wildlife Control Consultant. You can reach me at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Take a few moments, drop me an email, tell me how the show is going. If you have ideas for future broadcasts, 
definitely reach out to me. And even if you have criticisms, tell me what you don't like. I'll take that criticism as well. Take a few moments, subscribe to the show. And remember, everyone, we want you to live the wildlife. Why? Because we want you to live the wildlife, not be the wildlife. Take care, everybody. 